seven words can change your life. If these seven magic words are received in consciousness and held there tenaciously in faith, you can become a new person through the power of seven vital words. Now one should never minimize the power of a word. For a word is only a symbol of an idea. And ideas change things. Emerson has a very dramatic and uh, lurid phrase. Cut a vital word and it will bleed. Which is his way of saying that a word is alive. Like you are alive. When you put words into combinations of numbers, you come up with some very interesting thoughts. Somebody has said that the ten greatest words in the English language are by Shakespeare. And I'm prepared to believe that anything Shakespeare might say could be in that category. For outside of the Bible, he's probably been the most quotable writer who ever wrote. But the ten words referred to are these. To be or not to be, that is the question. And that is a powerful statement. Ten magic words to determine your life. There was one time in this country a Shakespearean actor by the name of Walter Houston. And he said that eight words were, in his opinion, the greatest words in the English language taken from an old spiritual. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen Glory, hallelujah. And that is utterly magnificent. And one night I was making a speech with a great sales expert at a sales gathering, and he told that great audience that there were six words which determined the success of any enterprise. And he held the audience on the edge of their seats for 15 minutes before he enlightened them about what the six words were. And they were these. Find a need and fill it. He said, if you'll do that, whatever you're working at will be a success if it fills a need. But the seven words, which are the greatest words, the words which can really change your life, are these. I can do all things through Christ. Now, I've left off the last three words of the sentence. I was preaching one time in London, England, and after the service they had a, what they called a fellowship hour, or rather a witnessing hour. And about as many people went back as could fill the room. And a lady came up to me and she said to me, very surprisingly, uh, show me your hands. Well, I put them out like that. I said, there they are. She said, all right, what do you think is the most important finger you have on your hand? And I wasn't too sure whether it was the thumb or whether it was this finger, middle finger. Surely couldn't be the little finger. So I finally decided it was this one, the forefinger. And she said, you have two of them. I said, yes, I'm, from the standpoint of my hand, all here. And she, she said, now hold those 
two fingers out. And then start counting with a little finger. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Well, make it ten words or make it seven words. They have an enormous efficacy. What I mean to tell you is this. You really get going with those seven words or those ten words, really meaning it, really believing it, really practicing it, and anything that's in your life now that isn't good can be cast out. And your life can be changed. I can do all things through Christ. Well, now that's promising a lot. All things. The word all is encompassing. It means everything that a human being can do. You can do. Not through your own strength, because that's only moderate. But through the strength which Christ endows you. It's really something. That's why Christianity is so powerful. It really promises great things. And furthermore, it delivers on them. One thing it'll do is to take out of your mind the concept of disability. Now, what does disability mean? It means ability discounted. Disability. And how many people in this congregation, the preacher included, have said to themselves and even to other people, I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't. I can't. I can't. That's the disability concept. And when you're in Christ, you move from the disability concept to the ability concept. I can! I can! I have the capacity. Well, now, this is nothing new. I read where Virgil said something about it. Now, I didn't look up the date of Virgil. But it was a long while ago. There is nothing new under the sun. There is no new idea. We're left to handle what we already know. And don't do. Virgil said, They are able who think they are able. And the people who really take those seven words know that there just isn't anything of which they're not capable of handling. Either living with it, dealing with it, or getting a victory over it. In our magazine guidepost, we had a story not long ago about a man whose name was not given, only his nickname, Rusty, R-U-S-T-Y. He was 60 years old. Dynamic man, athletic, outdoor person. Age 60. He stepped down from a curbstone, was hit by a drunken driver who got away, left him floundering in the street, they picked him up, took him to the hospital. His legs were crushed, both of them. And the surgeons did an excellent job on him. They pieced it together as best they could. And then he said to them, how long will it be before I start walking? And the surgeon said to him, well, Rusty, we've got to give it to you straight. You're 60 years old and bones in a person 60 do not mend as rapidly as when they're younger, and the likelihood is they won't mend at all. So I guess you'll have to settle for the fact that you will never walk again. Rusty said, thank you, doctor. 
But you know, I have another doctor as well as you, and I think you're great. And that doctor and you are working together. You've finished your job. You've put the bones all together. Now the other doctor will make them to heal. He said, who is this great doctor? Well, he said his name is, uh, he keeps office in the New Testament. He said his name is Jesus Christ. And the doctor said, I know, I believe in him too. And he is a great doctor. But you have to face the facts. Rusty said, I am going to face the fact. And the fact is that I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me the strength. That's the fact that I'm going to face, not the fact of disability that you're giving me. Well, it was an audacious thing to say. But after a while, they patched him up, had a cast from hip to toe, sent him home on crutches. Wasn't long till he was pushing his way around the living room. And then they went back for further x-rays, and they blinked because they saw that the bones were healing smoothly and uh, perfectly. One day, Rusty said to his wife, I'm going down to the beach, because by this time he'd developed arthritis in the ankles. And she said, well, the beach is a long ways off, and you have no car, and you couldn't drive one if you did have. He laboriously walked many blocks to the bus on a cane, went to the beach to practice hydrotherapy, and as he splashed in the water, he said, Dear Jesus, you and I and the doctor are healing these ankles. He had a gold-headed cane somebody had given to him. When he got home, he didn't have the cane. And the wife said to him, where's the cane? Oh, he said, I met a poor old fella, told me he was 55, who says he has arthritis so bad he can't walk. I gave him my cane. Because, you see, I don't need it anymore. And then came a day when he climbed on a horse and took his three grandchildren gaily up the mountainside. And when asked about it all, he said, why? All my life I have believed in the power of Jesus Christ in human life. And I hadn't the slightest doubt of my ability with his help to overcome that. Uh, right away, your mind begins to run into all the cases that it didn't have to turn out that way. Because, you see, the tendency of the human mind is to reject. But there's a greater factor in the human mind not to reject, but to accept. So, right there, say to yourself, I can do all things through Christ. And then put that statement up against a thing that's been defeating you. This is one of the glories of the Christian faith. To believe that. For it's true. Those seven words can change your life. But of course, the problem is to have faith like this. That's why the Bible says, except ye become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Now, little children, believe. I have eight grandchildren. I associate with them, and uh, I learn a lot from them. I had to babysit for, with one of them not long ago, and I had to learn patience. And I sure did learn it. <laughs> Because I've never seen so much energy pushed into a little form. <laughs> Grandpa, do this. Grandpa, do that. Hey, Grandpa, what's the matter with it? Get going. Get going. And poor old Grandpa had about had it. I had to fall back on my own preaching to get over the situation. <laughs> the other day I picked up a little book called Children's Letters to God. 
by Eric Marshall and Stuart Hample. And this is really priceless. They, they believe in God. God is an actual fact, figure, father. No doubt about God. They haven't gotten around to any speculation yet. They just take him as he is. And these letters are all written in their own handwriting. I copied them off. And I can read their handwriting better than I can read my own. But this is the way some of them go. Dear God, last week it rained three days. We thought it would be like Noah's Ark, but it wasn't. I'm glad of that because you could only take two things, remember, into the ark. And we have three cats. <laughs> Goodbye now, Donna. Dear God, if you can do all these things, you must be pretty busy. When is the best time I can talk to you? I know you are always listening, but when will you be listening hard in Troy, New York? <laughs> Sincerely yours, Alan. And here's another one. Dear God, we're going on a vacation for two weeks Friday, so we won't be in church. I hope you will be there when we get back. <laughs> when do you take your vacation? Goodbye, Donnie. But this one here is the payoff. This is it. Dear God, count me in, your friend Herbie. <laughs> now, you see, if we could all remain children, we would all have a pure, undefiled faith. Maybe the world would be better off if we never grew up, if we were always children. Because then we would dream. Then we would believe that nothing is too good to be true. Then we would believe that we could capture our dreams. Then we would believe that everything is wonderful. Huxley said, the secret of genius is to carry the spirit of the child in the old age. Well, what did he mean by that? He meant certainly that you keep your dreams, you keep your ideals, you keep your hopes, you keep your faith, and you believe that you can do all things through Christ who gives you the strength. So that if you have faith, you then have the power. I read about a doctor, a very Christian doctor, and he had a patient, a 17-year-old boy. This was uh, back a few years before we had all these wonder drugs. And this boy had pneumonia. I call, recall well when I was a boy that people died of pneumonia. Lots of them died of pneumonia. It was a very fatal disease. And then through the genius of science, drugs were developed, which makes pneumonia today much less fatal than formerly, although it's still not to be minimized. This boy, only 17, had had some blows, and he was discouraged, despondent, maybe that's why he got the pneumonia. And he was in a coma. He's unconscious. The doctor said, this boy is healthy. No reason why he should die. But as I see it, he'll die before morning. After a long while, he said to the people standing around, this boy needs a transfusion. And everybody spoke up and said, we'll give him blood. Ah, oh, he said, he, he doesn't need blood. He needs a different kind of transfusion. He 
must have the will to live. For some reason, he hasn't got it. He needs a transfusion of faith. And he said, who is there in this group who has enough faith to give this boy a transfusion of that faith? What a doctor. There was a farmer there, a relative of the family. He reached in his pocket and he pulled out a Bible and he said, here, I have the faith. What shall I do? The doctor said, project your own faith into his deep unconscious. Well, the farmer knelt down by the bed, put his mouth close up to the boy's ear, and began reading to him and quoting to him passages of faith. One of them must have been, I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. There was an old-fashioned clock in the room, and it was ticking in the silence. It ticked on one hour, two hours, three hours. Still, the farmer read the passages of faith, visualizing them sinking into the deep unconscious of this patient in an unconscious condition. And finally, the boy stirred, opened his eyes, looked at the man, looked round the room, gave a smile closed his eyes, and fell into a deep sleep. The doctor said, thank God, he's past the crisis. He will get well. What made him well? The ineffable faith which created the desire to live. Now, I see nobody in front of me here this morning who's sick to that extent, at least from appearances. But we're sick in the presence of difficulty, hardship, trouble, sinfulness, and everything. That's why you've come here this morning. That's the only great reason for being here, to get an infusion of faith. So that when you go outside into this difficult world out there, you will be able to say... I have the secret. I can do all things through Christ, which uh, strengtheneth me. Seven wonderful magic words. Let them sink into your mind. Hold them there until by process of osmosis they sink into the deeper unconscious. Believe them, for they're true. That sky out there is true. The wind that blows is true. The sun that rose this morning is true. The rain that falls from heaven is true. These words are true. For they came from the same God through His Son, our Savior. So, Say them to yourself. Better still, let's say them out loud now, everybody. I can do all things through Christ. And you can. That's for sure. And God bless you.